Um, so let me give you the title, then let's pray. I entitled this, Move Past Regret. Okay? Move Past Regret. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you for this morning. And as we look at your word and as we hear your word, as I preach it, open our hearts, our minds, cause us to understand. But beyond just mental assent, may we truly respond to your word so that you can set us free and that we might be made more whole, O oh Lord, set free from our brokenness. And this is our prayer, Lord, because we really want to be able to serve you with the right motives, with a pure heart. That is our desire, and this is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, so move past regret. As you know, we're doing a series, and our theme, even though we've moved into June, uh, is still there is more wholeness. And uh, wow, it's June already, you know, it's halfway through 2019, you know. And uh, uh, this is the fourth in our series of eight, okay? This is our fourth in this series. And we've been talking about this and moving towards wholeness. And as we had seen over the past few weeks, that because of sin and our separation from God, we have been broken, you know, irreparably broken. Uh, at least by human effort, we are irreparable. And, and uh, I've been talking about, you know, hopefully, I, I hope you took the time to look for the book, Life's Healing Choices. You know, it will really help you because I cannot cover everything uh, in that book, even on a chapter-by-chapter -chapter basis. There are other things in the book that will really help you. Uh, so please take the time to purchase the book. You can get it through our local bookstores uh, or uh, as an e-book, okay, through uh, Amazon, Kindle, and, and a few others. Do take the time to do that and read, keep up with us, okay? If you want to read ahead, that's up to you, but keep up with us at least. Now, I've said before that we are today, where we are right now in our life, for better or worse, is the summation of all of the choices we have made, both good and bad choices, wise and foolish choices, and we've made a lot of both, you know, hopefully more wise, but knowing most of us, we've probably made more foolish choices than wise choices. We've probably made more bad choices than good choices. And that's why we are going through what we are going through right now. Some areas of our lives may be okay, but there are areas, other areas in our lives that still need to be made whole, still need healing, a touch from God, still need a, a, a wholeness in them, need to be put together. Okay? The good news is that we can actually start making good choices to bring us to a better place in the future. Good choices, most of the time, even bad choices, you don't see the results right away, you know, but the results will come. It's cause and effect, it's sowing and reaping. Whatever a man sows, that also will he reap. And so the more foolish choices we make or sow, the more uh, foolish consequences we will reap, and vice versa. The wiser choices, then the wiser consequences that we're going to reap as well. Now, because of brokenness in this world, and there, you know, we're not the only ones broken. Everyone, every human being except Jesus Christ, every human being is broken to one degree or another. Okay? And because we live in a broken world, we have been hurt by other people, just as we ourselves have hurt other people as well. And because of this, there is much regret that we have. Regrets about decisions that we've made, you know, from a place of brokenness. And we wish we could go back and change them, but we can't. Once something is done, once we've done something to hurt someone, once we've said something to hurt someone, you can apologize, but the damage, the hurt, the wounding has been done. You can say something recklessly, and then five seconds later say, oh, you know what, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Or I didn't mean to say it that way, but you know what, the damage was done. That's the thing. 
the damage was done. We can apologize, you know, which is good. We need to do that. We can apologize, but we've already hurt the person. Or the same thing. Somebody says something, they don't mean to say it that way, but that's how you understood it, and you got hurt. You got offended. And offense is one of the most potent weapons of the enemy, and he will use offense. Offenses will come. And sometimes we are the offenders, and it causes much regret in us. And, it, and, and because we can't change the past, it makes us feel guilty. And ch some choose to deny their guilt. Others choose to repress their guilt. They drown it in whatever, alcohol, drugs, computer games, pornography, you know, sports, and anything that will dull the pain and hopefully make them forget. While some blame others. Well, it was not really all my fault. You know, it was also their fault. And, and so we try and wash our hands of the guilt because we don't know how to deal with the regret that we feel. But regardless of how we try to bury our guilt, it will always, guilt, listen, guilt will always skew our worldview. It will warp how we see the world. When we don't know how to deal with guilt, regret comes, and this has a way of perverting or skewing uh, our worldview, and whether we like it or not, it will alter our behavior. Now, how does guilt do this to us? There are many ways. Let me just share with you very quickly three ways. First, guilt will destroy your confidence. It will destroy your confidence. Guilt makes us feel insecure because we're always worried that somebody will found out, find out what we did. Something we've been trying to hide and somebody somehow will find out. The Bible says, be sure that your sin will find you out. And that's why sin must be buried in the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only way. But until we go to Christ, your sin will find you out. And so here we are. We know what we did. And we're always trying to repress it. We're trying to deal with it. We're trying to hide it. And we, we, we try and control our circumstances. Remember, we talked about that in the first session in this series. And we try and hide that but it somehow it, 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 it surfaces. You know, it's, it's like a beach ball that you try and push underwater, and for a while you're able to do it, but eventually you get tired, and it just somehow pops up, and we try and get it and put it down again, but it's too late. People saw it. People saw that you're, the, you're holding the ball, and it destroys our image. And the thing that we fear is that when people see these things, we fear that they might not like us anymore. Gadyang kapala. Oh, you did that? Oh my gosh. And they might not like us anymore. And that's one of the things we fear. Another thing guilt does is it keeps us stuck in the past. Guilt keeps us stuck in the past. Guilt replaces in our minds that thing that we regret. It plays it over and over and over again. And the devil rides on it. He's the one that presses the play button every time we hit pause. You can't stop it. Only the blood can. We, but, so we hit pause and the devil just unpauses it and plays that scene over and over again. And so we're riddled by guilt and regret. Things in our minds, that images that we see again and again. Sometimes we forget. For a while we forget. And all you need is a trigger. Someone says something. Somebody does something. Somebody, you know, wears something that triggers, associates, you know, you to that thing that you did in the past that you're trying so hard to hide. And you hide it with a smile. But it's too late. Regret has reared its ugly head again. Things we wish we could change, but we can't. And you know what? Feeling guilty and staying there, feeling guilty about it, cannot change the past. 
No matter how much you regret, no matter how much guilt you feel, it cannot change your past. What's done is done. There is no rewind button in life. None. You cannot go to the past and undo what was done. Unless maybe you have the time infinity stone. But we don't. And so because we feel bad about what we did, we end up condemning ourselves. And somewhere there at the back of our minds, the devil says it. You're so bad. And it comes to a point where we begin to believe it. And we say, yes, I am so bad. I'm so worthless. I'm so this and I'm so that. And we condemn ourselves. Guilt causes you to condemn yourself. And because we feel bad about what we did, and then we can't do anything about it, so we just continually condemn ourselves. And you know what? Condemning yourself doesn't help at all. In fact, self-condemnation will only destroy you even more. It will make you feel worse. And when you feel worse, you will do worse. Because like I said, hurting people hurt people. And so here you are, you're hurting. Somebody says something and you snap at them. And it's not even their fault. And so now you just hurt someone else. You hurt another person, another victim of our regret and our self-condemnation. So God wants to heal us. That's the good news. He wants to heal you. Amen? He wants to bring wholeness. And this whole thing we're talking about is a journey towards wholeness. And so I, I really hope and pray that you take the time in, our, in your care groups to discuss these things so that you will... You, you can't do this by yourself. You'll see why in a little while, but you can't do this by yourself. We need one another in this one. So God wants to heal us. And the first thing we said in, in the first part of this series is that we need help. We, when we realize how broken we are, we need help. And the second one we saw is that we need to change. Now that we know we've made mistakes, we need to change. And in the third part, we saw that there is a way. We need to make that commitment to God through Jesus Christ, so that change can begin. Until then, you cannot change. You cannot. You can only change one hurt for another hurt. You can only change one vice for another vice. But you cannot be set free, because if you can, then Jesus did not need to come. We can set ourselves free. But the fact that Jesus had to come, means we are hopelessly trapped in our brokenness. Until we cry out to someone, see, a broken thing cannot fix itself. When your car breaks down, you can't tell your car, fix yourself. You have to bring it to the shop where someone that knows the car can fix it. The only one that knows us well enough is God. And until we go to Him, we remain hopelessly trapped in our brokenness. And this fourth choice that we need to make is about moving past guilt because the devil will use it. We know we need help. We know we need to change. And hopefully by the third, last week, you know, the third um, uh, installment, we made that decision. For those of you that have done that before, good for you. For those of you that just gave your lives to the Lord, you are on your way. But you know what? Just because you're saved doesn't mean that everything in your life is already fixed and perfect. You are saved, but still broken. And so... God now, through this process that the Bible calls sanctification, is going to put us together again, little by little, one step at a time. He's not going to do it in one snap of a finger. But the first thing we need to realize is that when we gave our lives to Jesus Christ, all of our sins are forgiven. All 
our sins. Past, present, and future, all our sins. And that's good news. Amen? That's good news. All our sins are forgiven, which means He dealt with the guilt part. You're no longer guilty. Heaven's court pronounced you not guilty. See? And that's the good news. So our guilt was taken away, which means our regrets now can be dealt with. Our present, all our sins have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then he says this, that in Christ there is no more condemnation. So the regret that brings guilt, which brings condemnation, has been taken away. Romans 8.1 says in the Living Bible, so there is now no condemnation awaiting those who belong to Christ Jesus. There is no more condemnation. The moment, the very moment you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, all condemnation has been wiped away all the way until the day you die, and throughout all eternity, there will be no more condemnation. Now, you might still feel some condemnation, but that's not coming from God. That's us listening to the devil and then agreeing with him, and then we end up condemning ourselves again. Because you know what? We haven't forgotten what we did in the past. Just because you're saved, you haven't forgotten. And the devil will use that and say, you're already a Christian, but do, you, do they know what you really are? Do they know what you did? You think just by becoming a Christian, all of those things are forgotten? See, the devil will use that. Even though the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's what? A new creation. The old is what? Passed away. It's over. It's finished. That is our present reality. That means the past has no hold on you. But here's the thing. Even though the past has no hold on you, sometimes what we do is we hold on to the past. The past has let go because the past cannot hold you anymore. By, by royal divine decree, God said, past, you are over. Let go of that person. And so the past lets go. But here we are going back to the past and say, I miss you. And the past says, I miss you too. But it's forbidden love. God said, I can't hold you anymore. He said, never mind, I'll hold you. And that's what we do. We flirt with our past. And then all these feelings of guilt and regret and condemnation come flooding back. And then we wonder, am I really saved? Well, you're flirting with your past. Then you wonder whether you're saved. Break off clean. Amen? Break off clean. Don't, don't let it be sticky. You know, you'd like mozzarella cheese. You separate. and So many things still sticking. You just need scissors and once and for all, it is over. It's over. Just, just say right now, past, break na tayo. See, you have to break off with your past. Amen? It's over. It's finished. It's finished. It is done. Amen. Amen. It is over. Now, here's the thing. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you'll never make mistakes again. It doesn't mean you'll never hurt anyone again. Why? Because even though we're saved, there's still a lot of brokenness. See, there's still a lot of brokenness, and that brokenness gets healed as we spend more time in worship. That's why coming to service late is not a good idea. See? Bato bato sa langit. But you get healed as you spend time in worship. You get healed as you spend time communing with our Father in heaven. You get healed as you spend time in the Word and understanding it. Not just reading for the sake of reading, but understanding it, loving the Word, eating the Word, meditating in it, you know, understanding it and, and, and memorizing it and quoting it and declaring it, things you do with the Word of, word of God. The more you do this, the quicker the healing and the wholeness takes place. But when we spend just 
reading one verse, one chapter a day, I mean, it's better than nothing, but you're not going to get well. It's like the doctor says, you got to drink your medicine three times a day, but you only say, well, I only have time to drink it once a day, every other day. You're not going to get well. See? That's the thing. And that's how we treat, oftentimes, our Christianity as though it's something separate from us. It's only a Sunday thing. But Christianity is not a Sunday thing. We are desperate. We need God in our lives. So just because we're saved doesn't mean that we will never hurt anyone again and that we will never be hurt again by anyone because there's still brokenness. Saved, but in the process of being made whole. Amen? So we will still react. We still get hurt. We can still get offended. How many of you here never get offended anymore? I mean, you're just sanctified through and through. Yeah. <laughs> never get hurt. You always understand. You know, when somebody says something hurtful or does something hurtful, the first thing out of your mouth, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know? <laughs> yeah, I wish, right? I wish. I wish we could say it and mean it. <laughs> I mean, we can say it. Father, forgive them because they're so stupid. <laughs> you know, instead of saying they know not what they do, no? <laughs> so what's important now, part of the process of being made whole is that we need to be aware where we're broken. See, being blind to where you are crippled will not uncripple you. It's still there. You may not see it because you choose to be blind, but it's still there. So the wounds are still there. Being made aware is the first part. So, you, you know, it's like when you go to a doctor and the doctor says, where does it hurt? No, it doesn't hurt. And you, here you are, crumpled in pain, but you are in denial. And, and the doctor will have a hard time dealing with you. See? So you have to show, where does it hurt? It hurts right here. And guess what the doctor will do? He'll touch it. And you feel like punching your doctor. <laughs> See? Well, guess what? God does the same thing. Where it hurts, that's where He'll put His finger and say, and then they'll press and say, does it hurt? Even before you pressed, it hurt. <laughs> it doesn't hurt anymore. It hurt hers. And you press harder, it will be the hurtest. You know, see, that's the problem. But they have to press, they have to palpate, they have to know if there's something there, there's some underlying problem. And then they might even say, oh, we might have to operate. And so they're going to cut you to get that thing out. And guess what? Many times that's how God deals with us. He presses and then He has to cut. The Bible says that the Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. He doesn't use a scalpel, He uses a sword. And he doesn't know what Novocaine is. God just cuts, I tell you, and it hurts. So the, the thing we need to do is we need to be aware of the areas where we still need to change. Because if we don't change, guess what? You will continue doing what you used to do when you were not saved. And although you are saved, you will still be hurting people and people will be hurting you even though you are saved. But as you go and look into your life, don't do this by yourself. It's important to have the Holy Spirit guide you or when you start digging up, you're, you're, you're going to end up condemning yourself. And that's not the point, to condemn yourself all over again. Look at this in Psalm 139. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. This is a prayer. This is the prayer of this psalm. He's saying, you know what, Lord? I know there's a problem with me, so search me. I'm giving you permission. That's the thing. Many times what we do is we hide from God. Like Adam, when he said, Adam, where are you? He hid. Instead of saying, search me. I have a problem. Search me. He's, what he did was he hid. 
And he said, did you eat from this tree? And I, well, you know what? It's the woman. So now he's blaming someone else for his lack of responsibility. And he was hiding his sin. And this psalmist is saying, search me. I expose myself. Search me. And here's my heart. Search. Know my heart. Search me. I'm giving you permission. And then guess what else he says? Now test me. See, as he searches, he says, Okay, son, you have a problem in this area. And you know what's the first thing we do? Well, you know what, Lord? It's not that bad. <laughs> we like to minimize. It's not that bad, Lord. So what does this psalmist say? Test me. Bring a test. Bring some trouble my way. I want to know how badly hurt I am in that area. I want to see how I will respond when someone tests me. Bring the one I'm so in his at. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> okay, that's honest. <laughs> See, here's a person that is desperate. Search me. There comes a point when you just love God so much. You want to be so much like Him. You want to be set free from everything that is ungodly. And yes, it hurts. But this is a bold prayer. He says, search my heart. And then after you search, test me. And know my anxious thoughts. The one that says, not yet. <laughs> See? So test me. Send someone my way. Turn my situation around. Let me see how I will respond. Because I can... Here's the problem. We lie to ourselves too much. And what's worse, we believe our lies. No, I'm not that bad. Well, let's check. Test me. So I will know whether I'm really not that bad or maybe I'm not that bad, I'm worse. So test me. And then look at this, verse 24. Point out anything in me that offends you. Anything. Uh, son, uh, you watch too much TV. What? Yan lang? Well, you said anything, son. Anything that offends me. I'm not saying don't watch. You're just watching too much. See? This is a scary prayer. How many of us would dare pray this and mean it? Point out anything in me that offends you. And then lead me. See, here's the thing. It's hard to lead someone that is broken. That's why the leading came after. Lead me, but that's after. First, search me. Test me. Then, show me. Point out anything in my heart. And then, lead me. The thing, the places in our lives where we are broken are the places where we will have extreme difficulty following God. So we must, we must be made whole. So that, that's why the Bible says, Jesus said, first, deny yourself. Then take up your cross. That part, the part that needs to die, put it on the cross. So that the part that should not die can live. And that's the one that follows me. But the flesh, that stays on the cross. Because the flesh will not follow Christ. It will not. And what's going to help us in this is to write it down. I'll talk a little bit more about it in a little bit. But when you write it down, be specific. Take responsibility for your faults. I did this. This is my fault. Because like I said, let's face it. You are forgiven, but you're not perfect yet. Not yet. You're not whole yet. We're in a process. And that's why the Bible tells Jesus, actually through Paul, tells us to love one another. Jesus said the same thing, love one another. And that means be patient. Love is 
patient and kind and so on and so forth. So that's how we are to love one another. You know why? Because we are all in different stages and degrees of brokenness. And you will end up, even within your own care group, someone inevitably will say something that will offend you or will do something that will offend you. Someone is bound to say something and you will get hurt. And the Bible says, be patient with that person. Be kind, even though they said something recklessly. Be kind. Be understanding. Be gentle with that person. That's why the church, if you remember what one of our friends, uh, Scott Partridge, actually said, the church should be a safe place to fall. If we fall because we get hurt, let it be here. Because we know people will pick us up. People will encourage us, not kick us down further. Amen? That's what care groups are for. So when you write down these things, there are a few things that you need to understand. First, be radically honest with yourself. Because lying to yourself will not help you be honest if it's your fault it's your fault if you said this you said it don't minimize it you said it this is probably the hardest part because we don't like to look bad not even to our own selves don't rationalize your sins you're not saying you know it happened a long time ago it's it's over or you know it was just a stage in my life I was going through you know, it's just a, as a teenager, I was just a rebel. And so I was just fighting everyone. It's just a stage. I, I, I'm, I'm over it. Yeah, but while you were there, you hurt people. It's a good thing it was just a stage, but you still hurt people. And some people still carry that hurt to this day. Second thing is stop blaming others. Stop blaming others. You know, well, it was not all my fault. You know, it was, in fact, it was mostly their fault. I'm just an accessory to the murder, so to speak. Now, this may be true, but the point is to realize where you sin so that you don't do it again. So you become aware, oh, I'm broken here. I need healing here, Lord. And like I said, this is not to bring back the guilt. Okay, remember, all your sins are forgiven in Christ, but it doesn't mean you'll never sin again. It doesn't mean that you'll never hurt anyone again. So being aware where you blew it will help you change. But I want to say something also. If you were in your past physically or sexually abused as a child or an adult, okay, know that it's not your fault. Because many times when you were molested, sexually abused, you know, somehow we feel like it's our fault that it happened to me. Okay? Don't do that. Especially if you were a child. It's not your fault. And it's important to understand that. At the same time, we need to take responsibility for the hurt that... We need to take responsibility for the people that we hurt as a result of the brokenness that came because of that molestation. See, the molestation itself was not our fault, but in our brokenness, we hurt other people. We're responsible for that. I said, well, you know, I was molested. That's why I did that. And we just try and brush it off. But that's not also right. At the same time, I want you to understand, if you were the sex offender, that in Christ, your sins are forgiven. If you have truly repented, your sins are forgiven. It's been cleansed and washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. But understand that there may be people that are still hurting as a result of that offense. You know, one of the things that uh, I recently 
came to a realization about myself. I wasn't going to share this, but I'm, I'll, I'll just go ahead and share it. I, I, I took the time to share it with my family so they know about it already. But uh, it was only this year that I realized that I was molested. You know, it's, it's like I wasn't really, I think I, I don't, I don't remember if I was in prayer. I think I wasn't. I was just thinking about something, and then all of a sudden, it, it dawned on me. Like, I got molested, and it, it's like I was brought back to that place, and I saw it with my eyes. I, I, I saw what happened, and it came back to my, oh my, I was. But because I've been in Christ for so long, it was easier for me to just say, I forgive that person. But in the process, I realized that's why I was the way I was. That's why in my teenage years, I did what I did. I was reacting to that, and I didn't even realize why I was doing all of this. And for the longest time, I couldn't understand why I was... I'm not like that anymore now, praise God, but I was like that. And I couldn't understand why until, you know, maybe because I've just been asking myself, and all of a sudden, just... The Lord just dropped it in my spirit and said, this happened to you. It's like, now I understand. Now I understand. And I went to someone, you know, um, this was some time back, uh, because I hurt her really bad, you know. And, and I told her, um, I, I met with her one time just to apologize. I, I apologized to her in the past, and then the Lord showed me how, how bad I was about that situation, so I just needed to go back and apologize again, and so I went to her, you know, we had, we had coffee together, and I apologized to her, and she said, but you already apologized. Yeah, I know, but, you know, I, I apologized because it was the right thing to do, but now I'm apologizing because I now realize how much I really hurt you, and she said, oh, wow, thank you so much. I really appreciate that, you know. And so, you know, it went well, right? It went well. And as I was about to leave after the coffee and all that, I was about to leave. And, and as I was about to get into the elevator to leave the hotel, um, she, I just said one more time, you know, I just said, you know, I'm just really sorry about everything. She said, it's okay, but I want you to know something. You destroyed my life. It's like, <laughs> You know, and in my mind, it's like, what? Of course, I didn't say that, you know. <laughs> I didn't say that. Huh? Yeah, now, if she watches this, you know. Um, I don't know if she watches this, but, but the thing is, she, uh, uh, you know, I, I replay that in my mind, you know, that, that one line. Okay, na sana eh. I had to open my mouth, you know. But she said that, you know, and it's in my mind, it's like, what? I know I hurt you, but to say I destroyed your life? Well, the thing is, um, years after that, and this is the funny thing about regret. Time does not make you forget. It doesn't make you forget. That line, that last line before we parted ways, that last line just stayed in my mind for decades, literally decades. And it was... Not too long ago, I realized, just a few years ago, I realized I did destroy her life. I did. See? And so, I asked the Lord to, I mean, I can only say sorry so much. You know? After a while, I have to forgive myself as well. You know? I have to do that. And so the next thing we need to do is turn to God. We need to turn to God. And that's why if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus yet, He is our only hope. There is no hope outside of Him, none. Isaiah chapter 1 says, Come, let's talk this over says the Lord, no matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can take it out and make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. Even if you're stained as red as crimson, I can make you white as wool. Only Jesus 
can bring the healing that we so desperately need, the forgiveness that will set us free. We need to accept God's forgiveness so that we can forgive ourselves. And the thing about God's forgiveness is this. God forgives instantly. Instantly. 1 John 1, 9, If we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, He is faithful and just, true to His own nature and promises, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us continually. I like that word there. The other versions, the NIV, the New King James Version, they don't have that word. But when you look at the Greek, it's there. In the Greek, it's the tense of that word where He continually washes. It's the present tense. He continually washes us from all unrighteousness, our wrongdoing, everything not in conformity with His will and purpose. He forgives us completely. He forgives us freely. Romans 3.24 Yet now God declares us not guilty of offending Him if we trust in Jesus Christ. If we trust in Jesus Christ, who in His kindness freely takes away our sins. How good is our God? Amen? Freely. And He forgives us completely. Romans 8.1 Therefore, there is now no condemnation, no guilty verdict, no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus, who believe in Him as their personal Lord and Savior. That's the freedom we have in Christ. And yes, we are free from sin. We are free from guilt. And only then can He start to put our lives together. Not until then. But you know what? Here's the thing. It happens in a process. This coming together, I mean this this process of wholeness happens only in the context of community. In other words, it's not just you and God, but in community. It's called discipleship. As you allow yourself to be discipled by others, you will be made whole. Until then, you may be saved, but that process doesn't really happen. Because he said, go and make disciples. That's his command. And the process is baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, and teaching them, listen, teaching them to obey. It's not just teaching them the word. It's teaching them to obey. And part of that is love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, bear one another's burdens. How can we do that if we're so wounded? And so it's in that process of discipleship that we are made whole once again. And if you're not in a care group or you don't have a mentor, someone that can speak into your life on a regular basis, start. Start. Be part of a care group and start that process. And the last thing I want to share with you is Admit your weaknesses to another person. See, this is, a scru uh, this is a crucial step in your journey towards wholeness. But pastor, can't it just be between me and God? I'll just tell God, I mean... No, because part of what happens when you share with another person is you die to yourself. And that's a necessary process. James 5 says... Admit your faults to one another. Yes, admit it to God. Good. But look at this. Admit your faults to one another and then pray for each other. Why? So that you may be healed. So that you may be healed. What we want is we just admit it to God and then heal us. But that's not the process of God. Admit your faults to one another and then pray for one another. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. And that's why it's so important to love one another and to, 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 to encourage one another. Your care group should be 
the safest place in the world. And that's why confidence is very important. You must keep confidence so that people will be willing to share with you. So that through you, they might find wholeness. And the funny thing is this. God is willing to use us to be a blessing to other people even though our lives are not all together yet. We're all broken, myself included, and yet He uses us either as a preacher, as a care group leader, as a friend, as an encourager. He'll still use us in the midst of our brokenness. He will still use us. And that's the good news. Because if we're going to wait until we're whole, it's not going to happen. Not on this side of life. But it can happen that God will still use us. And that's why He does not wait. The reason why He doesn't wait is, let me make you whole first before I send you out. It's because in the midst of our brokenness, if we will allow ourselves to be used of God, then you know when you are a blessing to someone, it has been to be because of God. Not because I'm so great. Not because my life is all together. Not because I'm so holy and I'm so sanctified. And because I pray one hour every day. No, it's not because of that. It's because God is the one that's willing to bless you through me. What a joy and what a privilege. Amen? Then He gets all the glory. He gets all the glory, not us. He gets all the glory. So don't be afraid to be used of God. Don't be afraid. Yes, we're broken, but don't let it stop. Don't let it stop you from being a friend to someone else. And don't be afraid to be hurt because we have Jesus. People will hurt you. You don't have to go out of your way. You will still get hurt and you will still get offended. Whether you help someone or not, so might as well help people in the process. Then God gets glorified in your life. Amen? So this is what I want you to do in your care groups. Here's a chart up on the slide. Okay? You need to fill this up. The first one here, you see there's the person. right? That's the one that you resent or fear or hate, or are so tempted to murder, okay? So you just fill that place with a name. And then the next one is the cause. That's, the, that's what they did to you, whatever it is. You don't have to write down the whole stories. One word, one phrase is enough because you're not going to show this to anyone anyways. It's just you. And then after that is the effect. Because of what they did, this is what happened to me. This is how I got hurt. And the more honest you are about your feelings, the more you will be set free. And the last one is, this is my part, my fault in this, in that scenario, the cause. Maybe the reason why you got punched in the face is because you provoked that person. Now, you didn't punch the person, they punched you, but you provoked that way, you own up to what is your fault. Only then can you change. Because if you say, I had no part in this, I had no fault in this, I was just walking up and pow, they hit me in the face. You know, my only fault is because I looked ugly or my hair was, you know, bad hair day or whatever. But the point here is, you want to look. Did I have any part in that? Did I in any way provoke? Was I in any way an associate to this crime? And then, if you are brave enough, if you feel you are ready to be set free with your partner, you will open up and say, here's a person. May I recommend you start with your immediate family. Dad, mom, kuya, ate, 
bunso, whoever. Start with your immediate family because right there, you might need several pads of yellow pad. <laughs> you know, that's just the family. <laughs> There's no, no classmates yet, no Lolo, no Lola, Tito, Tita, you know, principal, homeroom advisor, you know, the, the bully in school, and all that stuff like that. And again, remember this as you do this. The point here is not to bring you back to your past and show you how bad you are. That's not the point. It's for you to realize I'm wounded here then you can bring it up to God and say, heal me. But the sharing with another person is a necessary process because the Bible says, pray for each other. I don't know if you've ever experienced this where sometimes people say, can you pray for me because I have a headache? And then you pray for them, they get well. But when you have a headache, you pray over yourself, it doesn't work. Because he said, pray for each other. He didn't say, pray for yourself. I don't find, at least not in my memory at the moment, any verse in the Bible that says, pray yourself. Pray for yourself. Heal yourself. No. It says, pray for one another. So someone needs healing, you can come. But when I need healing, allow me to come to you. So you can pray for me. And that's why we need one another. That's why discipleship is so essential to our growth and development as a spiritual being. We need it to be set free from our brokenness. Amen. My prayer is that we might truly allow ourselves to be open enough to share with someone we can trust. Don't just share this with anyone. Pick someone that you can trust. Someone who will pray for you. Someone who will understand and not be shocked by your past. And someone who will not judge you. There's too much judging going around. We just finished our elections. Too much judging that went around. We need to accept that no matter how broken I am, I need to feel safe that you will still accept me as I am. And we need to make that commitment to one another because that's what church is about. That's what church is about. Church is not just about coming to this place, singing a few songs, listening to the preaching of the word, and then we go home. That's not church. We are the church, you and I. We are the church, not this building. And so we need to be a safe place for people. And the reason why we can be a safe place is because we have no illusion of ourselves. We're probably more broken than the person talking to us. And when we begin to realize that, we will be less likely to judge them. And even if they judge us, I take solace in the idea that I can always say, Buti na lang, yan lang ang alam mo tungkol sa akin. <laughs> it's a good thing, that's the only thing you know about me because I'm probably worse. If I'm going to be honest, I'm probably worse than you think I am. And if we can think that way, then we will be less likely to judge one another and just love one another towards greater wholeness because we need to be made whole.